So welcome. Good evening, everyone. We'll get started. It is 6 o'clock. So my name is Sarah Tim. I am the Director of Education here at Maine Maritime Museum. I'm really pleased to see this room full. Um, it's really exciting to see the interest in this topic. It's new territory for us. Tonight, we launch a series of panel discussions titled Sea Change Dialogues. Over 2023, we'll host six of these panels, this one being the first, that intentionally dive into many different perspectives on climate change, the communities and industries affecting it's affecting, and the people working to change it. So tonight, we speak to the power of art in communicating the story of the Gulf of Maine. Future panels, if you're interested, will look into climate justice and policy through the eyes of youth, sustainability within Maine's blue economy, mental health and change within Maine's fishing communities, Wabanaki conservation initiatives, and local ec ecological knowledge as it's passed down through generations. So our hope with this series is not to preach, not to dictate, not even to necessarily change your mind. Rather, we hope that these discussions introduce new perspectives, provide a respectful and safe forum to ask questions, grapple with uncertainty, and maybe possibly spark a deeper understanding of the environmental, economic, and cultural complexities of the climate crisis here in Maine. So normally when I introduce speakers as part of our public programs, you may have seen me up here before, I recognize a few of your faces, I try to quickly say something witty, anecdotal, epically fail in that endeavor, um, and introduce our guest and exit stage right. But tonight I feel like it's really important to take a moment, acknowledge where we are and how we got here. So if you can indulge me, just give me a few more moments. So the opening of Sea Change, Light, darkness and light in the Gulf of Maine marks the first time that Maine Maritime Museum has stepped into the discussion on climate change. What took us so long? Well, sometimes that discussion on climate change is more of a shouting match. And it's a little scary, to be honest, especially as an institution with long ties to shipbuilding and industry. The crippling anxiety of potentially alienating different stakeholders on all sides of the subject was a common theme in our staff meetings. The question is, how do we approach this subject and not cause more harm? The answer to that came to us in the form of Anna Dibble, who's on our panel right here, artist and founder of the Gulf of Maine Eco Arts, which is an artist collective united in their call for action on the climate crisis. So over a year ago, Anna, in search of a new home and new possibilities for the Eco Arts installation Majestic Fragility, which was on view at Bigelow, she pitched an idea. How about an art installation that communicates two simultaneous truths? One, humans have harmed the earth. Full stop. Two, but there is a reason to be hopeful if we can work together. So after a bit of institutional soul searching, Maine Maritime Museum entered into this collaboration knowing we would turn some heads and maybe not always for good reasons for us. Perhaps we'll lose some members. We have already dealt with some internet trolls. But what we would gain would be worth it. By embracing difficult conversations, we are fully acknowledging the reality of maritime Maine in this moment. And by doing so, we can leverage our resources and our platform to amplify a thoughtful discourse. So tonight, we begin the formal conversation with our first panel, Environmental Advocacy and the Arts, Telling the Gulf of Maine Story. Our leading question tonight is how can the arts advocate for environmental issues in ways that no other discipline can? So for example, here are some graphics that really present the hard facts of Maine's warming waters. There it is. For some, this is enough to spur action. For most of us, and maybe you don't admit this out loud and that's okay, most of us it's not. Most of us need a story, an emotional connection. Like 
this fish. This fish lives in Cache's Ledge, photographed there. Cache's Ledge is a underwater mountain range in the Gulf of Maine, home to a rich ecosystem. How does he or she feel about this graph and where it's headed? What would it say if it could speak? Artists can answer that question. And that story that they tell has the power to turn this graph into this, action. And this is awesome. That's what we want. We want action. We want someone to figure out these problems. But did this group make sure to include her in the conversation? Sea change, darkness and light in the Gulf of Maine, at the core is a message of hope through the acknowledgement of human impact and the commitment to collaboration. By situating rather than centering human perspectives within the Gulf of Maine story, the Gulf of Maine eco arts creates a compelling experience of beauty and discovery that's hard to ignore. So tonight, our panelists will discuss the power of visual storytelling and advocating for our environment. Their backgrounds are diverse in art, marine science, education, but what unites them is their ability to tell stories that make us care. So let's meet them. First, we have Anna Dibble, whom I've mentioned already. Anna is a lifelong artist, writer, and founder, founding director of the Gulf of Maine Eco Arts Creative. Her work has been featured in exhibitions in the New England region for over 40 years, and she has found creative success as a writer and designer for Sesame Street, animation and film studios, opera, and theater. Anna is also an educator. Her work in bringing creative, hands-on experiences to classrooms around the region form a core part of the eco arts mission of advocating for the environment through the arts. So thank you, Anna, for joining us. Next, we have Jamie DeSimone, Chief Curator at the Farnsworth Art Museum in Rockland, Maine. I've known Jamie for quite some time. We've had the opportunity to work together over the number, a number of times during our careers, so I'm very excited to have you on the panel as well. I first met Jamie when she was the Curator of Contemporary Art at the Portland Museum of Art. And at this time, while she was there, Jamie collaborated with the Bildmusik in Sweden and the Reykjavik Art Museum in Iceland to debut the inaugural exhibition of the newly formed North Atlantic Triennial. The exhibition was titled Down North. This debut represents the first exhibit devoted entirely to contemporary art in the North Atlantic region and what many view as the front lines of environmental change. Next, we have Dr. Nick Record a senior research scientist at Bigelow Laboratories for Ocean Science, where he innovates ways to connect computational and social sciences to predict the future of our oceans. He is the director of the Tandy Center for Ocean Forecasting that uses big data, mathematical modeling, and machine learning to predict ocean phenomena. Things I don't know anything about, so I'm excited to hear, hear from Nick tonight. He also directs the Bigelow's Sea Change Semester program that connects undergraduates to, under, to ocean science in an immersive 14-week program. And last but not least, we have Deb DeBegan, an environmental science educator at the Maine College of Art and Design, the former president and current board member of the Gulf of Maine Marine Education Association, among other roles that bring community and resources to those wanting to advocate for the environment through education. Deb is a member of the Gulf of Maine Eco Arts creative team herself and has witnessed hundreds of art students navigate the climate crisis as the steward of Mecca's Sustainable Ecosystems Art and Design minor. So please join me in welcoming our panelists. So, now it's your turn. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, this is just gonna be a, a, a conversation among us. So we're gonna have about an 45 minutes, 50 minutes of conversation, and then we're gonna open it up to a Q&A session as well. So to get us started, I wanna start with Anna, because this is where our story begins. So I would love for you to tell us about the Gulf of Maine Eco Arts, the mission you had hoped to accomplish with this exhibit. Okay, I've been, I've been thinking about this a lot today, and um, there, it's a complex ex exhibit, so there are lots of messages and 
various parts of it, and you need to experience that for yourself and see what you think, um, which is the way I look at my own artwork. I, I do it, and then I put it out there in a gallery or the public, and then other people can figure out what it's about. And that's I look at this exhibit the same way. Essentially, my my whole goal with this from the very beginning, when I came up with this idea, which was four years ago, um, to create a um, large-scale sculpture installation that was based on what goes on underneath the waves in the Gulf of Maine, um, is that I became very aware that in our society, the way human beings look at themselves is, here are human beings, <laughs> neon sign, this is us, we're, we're up here. Nature, the natural world is down here with little kind of text. You can't see it very clearly, but it's here. The arts, also maybe even a little smaller over here. <laughs> when in reality, all of these things are all totally connected, all integrated. And this is something we've forgotten about um, over time. And I think it's the reason we're in so much trouble with the biodiversity crisis and the climate crisis because we've lost that connection. It sounds like a really simple concept, but it's really complex, apparently. And that's what I hope with this exhibit, that people will go in, they will understand they are part of an ecosystem, that the whale, the fish, the plankton, all the other creatures in this exhibit are just as important as we are. We're another organism. And until we understand that, we're not going to be able to figure out ways of mitigating this crisis or um, figuring out how we're going to adapt to the um, results of it. And that's my main thing with the exhibit. There are lots of other things about it, catches, ledge, all kinds of stuff, but that's, that's my central sort of passion for it. Yeah, and can you speak to a little bit to us about how um, you feel the arts, and this has been part of our conversation with the planning crew um, over the past year, how the arts are able to communicate and spur action in a way that just other disciplines are not able to do? Well, the, the arts connect to our emotions, unlike um, stuff that we're reading on screens or, or listening to through podcasts. Um, not that those things aren't part of the arts sometimes. It's just that with music and visual art and um, uh, sculpture and literature that's read out loud, poetry, all those things, they, they hit us more with our emotions. And if you're trying to communicate something as complex as climate change, biodiversity um, crisis, all those kinds of things, the arts are the best way of doing it. And my experience with working on this project for the last four years is that it's a, it, we, we worked with a, it's a collaborative with a lot of different people. And I found that actually getting people to work on something, the action of it, just getting involved with whatever part anybody can do. Everybody's got their unique way of getting involved with stuff, that that's what really makes change. Not just reading it something on a screen or listening to somebody or, you know, an armchair kind of philosopher. It's it's actually doing things. And and the arts are a part of that. That's that's the major thing about the arts. Yeah, and what I've I've also really loved um in your conversation, you just spoke to this about how the building of community, right, is really central to kind of making that personal connection and translating that into action. Um, I'm going to go off script a little bit, Deb and Nick, and since you both worked with Anna, um, can you maybe speak to a little bit of that sense of community um, that this team has been able to, to build and, and reflections on that? Go ahead. Okay. Uh, so I'll start with our most recent collaboration. Anna came to my fall class uh, at Maine College of Art. I'm a scientist. I'm not an artist, uh, but I teach science to undergrad art students. They're all getting their BFA. And we read about Cassius Ledge. We saw videos online about it. And one of the hands-on pieces we did is Anna brought in the, the kelp which if you've seen the exhibit, which is coming down from the ceiling, but it was scrunched up from a previous event. And so to see the students realize that they would actually be hands-on part of this exhibit by helping to free it so that it could be set up, I think it was really, really meaningful for them. They felt a part of it in 
an, a, there was a sense of agency in being part of a much larger exhibit than they would have necessarily been able to have their own student work up here yet. Um, <laughs> so that's one tidbit. And then also being together, hearing Anna's story, just when other folks come into the classroom, I think hearing people's personal connection to the environment or to the topic really sits with the artists in a way that uh, my graphs, as pretty and artistic as they may be, um, don't uh, don't don't get the message across. And so um, it's been really re rewarding, I guess. Um, yeah, I mean, I I think the the way that you like brought so many people in and built community around the art project and even that's reflected like you were saying in the experience of feeling part of this ecosystem as as you're there in it really resonates with me as a scientist because you know science has traditionally been done and uh communicated often like from the top down you know here's someone some expert um explaining something to someone who maybe wouldn't get it that kind of thing but when I think about the ocean, and I think about the future, I think about the future a lot. You have to when you run a forecasting center, because you're, that's what you're supposed to do, is say what's going to happen in the future. Uh, I think, you know, in a way, you could think of the future like a blank canvas or something that we are all creating together right now. Everything that we're doing uh, is contributing to this future right now. It could be many things, but ultimately it's going to be one thing that we all live and we all experience. And we all contribute to, in some way to what that future is going to look like. And I think that that's the way science should be done too, you know, especially when you're talking about the environment. You know, we're, all, we're all part of it, just like Anna was saying. Um, we're all sort of creating it as we live in it. And just to have a science sort of telling everyone the way it should be, um, you, you don't have that, um, you, I guess you lose that participatory nature of, um, that connection, the relationships we have with the world that we're building and we're creating. And you see it a lot in um, you know, the way science is being you know, taught now and uh, the way uh, there's participatory community and citizen science and that sort of thing. Um, as we go into this really changing world and changing ocean, I think that's the kind of participation and community that we need to make that future the one that we want to live in. Um, yeah, this, this sense of community, I think, can exist on a very local scale, right? I think kind of what Anna, you're doing with, with your work and your team of, of building those kind of one-to-one -one personal connections through the creation of art to kind of advocate for the environment. Same with your students, of, co of course. But then there's also, Jamie, I turn to you, the transnational community. Um, so before I get to your question, I do um, wanna make sure we highlight some of the great artists that were featured in Down North. So I want to introduce um, Olofsson's work here, Everywhere But Nowhere. This is a series of photographs that are also a site-specific installation, uh, the, which was on view at the PMA as part of, of this exhibit. So I'm going to just read from uh, a quote from the catalog here to explain kind of what this artist is trying to do with this series of photographs. And of course, Jamie will, will fill in the blanks here. But this artist is raising questions about community and belonging in the process of building community through a collective sense of place. So Jamie, as the curator who worked closely with this artist, um, I guess first, what was your vision for giving a voice to this transnational community, this <laughs> huge community um, defined by the North Atlantic? And kind of what did you learn from that conversation? What was your takeaway about the intersection of this community and uh, environmental change? Yeah, so a big question and a big responsibility. Um, when the Portland Museum of Art decided to launch the North Atlantic Triennial, our mandate was that the state of Maine uh, positions itself as the gateway to the Arctic. And so we were thinking about who our neighbors were in our proverbial front yard across the Atlantic Ocean. And what would it look like if we created a platform for cultural exchange? And that was coming out of a lot of conversations and conferences that I was attending over in Iceland, one being the Arctic Circle Assembly, 
where I was in attendance in 2018 when IPCC released their climate report uh, that was uh, kind of doomsday in the room for scientists and economists and um, policymakers. And there were about less than 10 of us representing the arts at that conference. And so it was at that moment, um, my colleagues at the Reykjavik Art Museum and I uh, committed to thinking about what a collaborative international partnership would look like in thinking about decentralizing what people understand the arts communities to be, particularly in the North. Um, and that led to not stopping in Iceland, really thinking about the full scale of what we consider North Atlantic. And this is also coming out of um, when I'm Skipped moved its North, Adm North Atlantic um, headquarters to Portland um, in 2014. So this was very uh, strategic and related to changes in the state of Maine's economy, but there were, we were not seeing those same changes in the cultural sector. And so the PMA at the time felt an exhibition model that a traveling triennial, something you don't really see, could help elevate our artists by giving them an international platform and vice versa. And so we then engaged the Bildmusik, which is in northern Sweden, um, to be our third partner. And the project is still traveling. It will open in Sweden in late May. Um, but uh, Matthias's work, I actually had uh, the great privilege to go to his home and to be in his village. And this is about two hours north of Umeå. So this is uh, literally nowhere in Sweden and we were sitting around his table looking at these photographs and I said I felt like I'm in Maine <laughs> and most people who came to see these pictures shared that with me um, and that title came about everywhere but nowhere because of that conversation we were sharing with each other um, in his home that the goal when he moved to this little village it was because he inherited his grandparents house he moved there during the pandemic to get out of the city, um, but he knew none of his neighbors, and he decided as an artist to do a community art project, photographing all of his neighbors in front of their house, and to revive a school and build a fire pit so they could gather as a neighborhood. And by village, I mean 30 homes. 30 homes, most of them seasonal residents, so not very different from some small towns we have here in Maine. Um, and it was an extraordinary experience for me to visit with him and understand the complexion of this town and how he, through art, built community, an ecosystem of a different conversation. Um, and I think what the guiding principle of the North Atlantic Triennial was that we didn't want to just have an exhibition about climate change. There, there are those exhibitions that do exist and they are um, wonderful and necessary so we were looking at this more as a cross-section of what artists were doing um, at that point in time, kind of a snapshot responsive to, uh, you know, almost 25 years into the 21st century. There are, of course, many artists tackling this topic, like Anna and others, um, where it is more relevant. Um, and so we can see through some of those other works how they are collaborating with scientists or other researchers to inform their art practices in more interdisciplinary approaches, which gets back to why the four of us are sitting here today. Yeah, and, and that's a, a great segue. Thank you, Jamie. You're uh, to kind of our next topic here is kind of art as science communication, um, art as science advocacy. Um, I'm just gonna pull up one more artist that was featured um, in the Down North exhibit. So this is Peter Soriano's uh, Illusat number five, uh, and again, a quote from uh, the fantastic catalog, uh, quote, an ongoing project documenting the rapidly changing environment of the high north, uh, emulating methodol methodical scientific observation, measurement, and documentation that is then translated into pattern and line to create site-specific drawings. So here Soriano's installation uses existing knowledge as a means to, again, quote, open a door to a new truth or a core that is no less important to us. And those are the words of your, your co-curator. So Jamie, 
you kind of touched on this, but can we dig a little more? How are artists tackling these complex topics of our time, such as climate change, um, in ways that uh, this half of the table um, is not, our scientists and our, our mathematicians? So, um, great question, and I think every artist would say, you know, a different answer or approach. Um, Peter, this idea to go to Disco Bay to observe icebergs as they were uh, traversing for sketches began by observing a melting ice pile in his backyard in Penobscot, Maine. <laughs> and that got him thinking about why uh, the sun was shining at a certain height during March and his snow piles were melting faster than they should be and why our winters here were changing faster than they should be. So when I started going to his studio and seeing wall drawings that looked like this and magnifying snow piles um, to a scale that were um, irrational, if you will, uh, he shared with me that he wanted to go up to uh, Pouch Cove in Newfoundland and eventually over to Greenland and his fascination with the Arctic, which I'm also fascinated with. So we, I was like, I'm going to get you there. And so I got him there. But the point is, he and we are oversaturated with images of icebergs. And after a certain point, there's this glaze, right? You don't see things. You don't understand things. Information is lost. So Peter had this idea to sketch, and what you don't understand in looking at this is this is um, probably almost to scale of the wall that he was able to draw on it. Um, and this was the drawing when it was done in Portland. He had a much larger wall in Iceland, which was almost the actual size of the iceberg that he was observing. But they're very mathematical drawings. Um, where he's taking, like scientists, uh, lots of data points, observations, formulas that he's created. I would not suggest that he is a scientist or there's any scientific reasoning behind them, but to him, there is, um, which is why there is a grid in the background. There are certain lines connecting the iceberg, potentially lifting it up out of the water smaller ones floating in the front. Um, so in his mind, this is a way to bring us to Greenland to experience a natural phenomenon that otherwise we could not in a way that is not just this icy, cool blue image on the internet. And so that's where I think, um, you know, back to what Sarah opened this conversation with, the power of visual storytelling is how the arts can convey data and information in a way that is beyond images that are just overpopulating our stream of consciousness on every single day. Yeah, I, I would love to, speaking of the limitation of that image of the iceberg, um, open to the table, kind of in your own disciplines, what are, do you see the limitations of science papers or of the classroom, the language that you have to work with to advocate for these causes? And, and again, Anna, kind of your work as well. What do you struggle with in terms of communicating? I, I, I tend to look at my own personal work, and I tried to look at this exhibit work as, as just what Jamie was talking about, that there are too many um, didactic images of climate change that people have gotten used to, and so many people are not facing what's really going on because I think it, there's just too much information, visual information. <sighs> So my, my whole approach with my own work, but also with, with this project, was, OK, the people that I curated for it, they, they all were involved with doing very non-didactic environmental work, but with, with a, a passion for the, the land and the other animals and you know this subject that we all talk about. And I think that that, that to me, that's a stronger message um, than, than one where you are spelling it out that's more um, in the common sort of usage, um, but you see it in advertising even now and stuff like that. So that you're you're coming from from left field. You're you're doing something that's that's different, and that's that's sort of, I think, a good approach. And I think about that a lot when I'm working because I don't want to have it be somebody look at what I'm doing or even the exhibit going, oh, that's what it's all about. You know, you want to get people to think and to try to 
kind of explore a little bit more. Um, sure, I'll go. Uh, yeah, so for me, uh, I'm a big math nerd, confession. Is anyone else here a math nerd? <laughs> All right, I'd say that's a slightly higher percentage than I usually <laughs> get when I ask that question. Um, Maine is not the place to grow up if you're a math nerd. Take it from me. Maybe it's better now, but it was not, not, a, not great in the 1980s. But anyway, um, in, the, in the 1980s, not that I was going out to sea back then, but um, you'd go out, oceanographers would spend lots of money, go out to sea, and get like the one data point or like one picture of the iceberg, and that would be the story. And the transformation that we've gone through in the last like 10 years, really, um, we've gone from having two little data, that one measurement of the iceberg, to just being flooded with data. And this has happened, of course, in all kinds of other fields, too. You know, you probably heard the word big data. Um, oceanography is maybe even a little bit late to the game. But now we have more data than we know what to do with. There's satellites, you know, flying around measuring the ocean. There's gliders and buoys that act like underwater dr drones, you know, sending us back information in real time. There's uh, technologies that read the DNA that's in the environment and turn it into zeros and ones. Um, and for me, as like a math geek, it's like turning on a light in a dark room. All of a sudden, there are patterns and, and things that you can see that have been invi invisible to us for, um, for, you know, as far back as you, as you look at the data. Um, but then, you know, like making that pattern of all of those numbers something that other people can connect to. I think that's where the disconnect is, which is why I love looking at Peter's image, because this is, it looks to me just like the sorts of patterns we start to, the sorts of images we start to create when we're trying to make sense out of those numbers. And like, you know, if you turn on a light in a dark room, if you think of that metaphor, we look around and we know immediately what we see. But the ocean is, is in a lot of ways like an alien planet. And you turn on a light on a, in a dark room on an alien planet, suddenly you've got to make sense of all these things that you've never seen before. And so you wind up with you know, images and graphics just like that. And, and um, one of the things I love about working with artists is you can, you can start to bridge that gap between these sort of um, zigzags and, and inexplicable patterns of the way that a, like a, maybe a mathematician might see the world to something that resonates with everyone else and, and tells a story, like you were saying, or connects with emotions, like you were saying earlier, um, so that when that light gets turned on, uh, people can make sense out of what they're seeing. You asked about challenges. Yeah, kind of what do you see, maybe perhaps in the classroom when you're you're teaching a lesson on a topic, yeah. and you're teaching two art students, a, right. a particular type of, of student. Um, what do you what do you struggle with, but then maybe you see your students kind of take and run with? Well, one of the things that I have struggled with over the time is how to deal with all of the overwhelming data and the doom and the fear and the anxiety and a lot of students signing up for my classes are signing up because they deeply care but they also don't necessarily feel empowered to do anything or know what to do and so um, I approach that by recognizing that it does feel overwhelming and uh, very intentionally sh shining a light on hopeful things that are going on so collaborations where there is conversation. Um, you know, I teach a variety of natural science classes, so conservation projects, uh, citizen science projects, ways that they can take the information and share it and that there is positive change happening. So that's, that's, some, that's an intentional choice that I have made. Um, and I still do run into the challenge when I have my BFA students read scientific papers and we muck through them together. <laughs> and some of them are more accessible than others. And so try to play that translator role and help them feel like they can sit down and read through it instead of just the headline, just the CNN headline. Um, that is a great transition cool. to yes. what do we do with scientific papers? Um, written by people such as Nick here. 
Um, <laughs> so I put this duality on this slide for a reason, and um, I think Nick says he's a mathematician, uh, but he is an artist as well. Uh, so we have a paper, a scientific paper here on the left. I chose a random screenshot of that paper because I liked the colors. Um, <laughs> Pretty artistic, right? The, it is. Do I know what's going on? And No, I don't. It is an overwhelming <laughs> amount of information. But we also need to acknowledge that that paper probably was not uh, written for me. I'm not in the Oceanography Society. But what uh, I want to highlight here and then serve as a segue in our conversation, uh, with permission, I want to share um, something that Nick did, what I am calling an illustrated abstract. So he uh, produced this video kind of to explain this paper. It's only two minutes long. Can I say beforehand yes. that I was homesick this day and had like nothing else to do? <laughs> and like you can even hear I'm kind of stuffed up in this video. <laughs> You're really going. You're so good. showing up in unexpected places where there was no protection. It started now. Now the species is in decline again, leading us to wonder, why did they stop visiting the speeding route when this happens? To answer this question, we need to date our whales or food to the oceanography. We gather 20 scientists from 10 institutions from all around the Gulf of Mexico and take private hands and it quickly became a big data process. When we crunched the numbers, we saw a clear pattern emerge. The decline in whales matched the decline in their food starting in 2010. Traced from ocean currents backwards through deep waters up to the Northeast Channel. These deep waters were much warmer starting in 2010. The whales' main prey, a tiny crustacean called Calamus, doesn't thrive in 2010. This deep channel was the entry point for major ocean currents in the eastern Gulf of Mexico. Because of climate change, those major ocean currents are changing as far as all the way out to the Arctic. The warmer deep waters into the Gulf of Maine starting in 2010 matched these changes. So to connect the dots, climate change is altering. Ocean currents. Now, much warmer deep waters enter the Gulf of Maine, bringing less food to the whales. Maybe the whales stop to go searching elsewhere. That makes them vulnerable to ship strikes and contaminants. Around the world, species, including humans, are reacting to sudden climate shifts. But what if we could be proactive instead of reactive? Because whales respond to ocean conditions, we might be able to predict their movements. We are working on ways to forecast where whales will be ahead of them to help prevent their deaths. I know a whale forecast might sound strange. But this is the sort of climate adaptation to a real need to meet the coming climate challenges. If we can find a solution for red whales, then we're set. Um, yeah, so there you have it. Uh, panel over. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Nick, that was awesome. That took a paper that, I'll be honest, I didn't really try to read closely, but knowing that the language would be difficult for me, um, took a concept and made it accessible. So I just want to give you an opportunity uh, to talk a little bit about that research that's featured in that, um, that video. So you analyze big data, you've mentioned that already, forecasting models, um, to advocate for informed sustainability, sustainability initiatives. Can you, on a introduce a what big data is for us um, how it connects to ocean forecasting and how it connects to your work with right whales yeah so i mean big data in general is i think everyone kind of has an intuition for this that there's just lots and lots of data out there um you know our our well this isn't a phone but if it were it's you know it's tracking everywhere i go there's um data on the environment streaming in all the time. There's all the financial tra transactions we're made all, all, that are being made all the time. There's this whole big sphere of data that is just um, uh, mind-bogglingly huge. That's kind of the big data part. There's also, there are other dimensions to big data. So there's volume, which is that amount. There's also data velocity. So data can move around the world like instantaneously now. You know, instead of going out on a ship, you can get information transmitted by satellites. 
There's data variety. So part of the challenge to this study was we weren't just doing a complete survey of whales across the Gulf of Maine. There are different types of technologies that measure them in different ways in different places by different scientists. Some of it's like really high resolution in one little area, and some of it's low resolution but has good spatial coverage, uh, just for example. And so part of big data is actually not so much the volume and the velocity, but the variety. I don't know why they all start with V. Some <laughs> like good big data marketer came up with that at some point. But variety is the other one. And so getting all of those different types of data to match is, that's kind of the math problem that I find interesting. Um, so, but putting all those pieces together, then you get this um, light being turned on in a dark room effect that I keep, um, need, a, need a new metaphor, but mm -hmm. that I keep talking about is like suddenly all of those, when you figure out the math and the collaboration, like going back to what Anna was saying and what the video says, there were 20 different institutions um, or 20 scientists from all kinds of different institutions. Same thing when we work across the Arctic, you know, we're all interested in the North Atlantic, but everyone has a different piece of the puzzle. So that collaboration is really important to getting that, that light to turn on. If you just focus on your little piece, you're gonna miss these connections, you know, the ocean currents connecting up to the Arctic. You know, we see like whales getting entangled or sh uh, struck by ships. You might not initially think, well, that problem originates in the Arctic or even it originates with the burning of fossil fuels. You might think, oh, well, let's deal with the, the ship or the gear that's locally what's happening, but there's this bigger picture going on. So I think that's kind of what, what big data gives us in the environment is, you know, a way for us to collaborate for one, a job for math geeks like me for two, but also like getting this big picture of what's going on. And I think a, a deeper, hopefully a deeper understanding and hope <laughs> at the end of the story. Yeah, and I'm sure the moment I said uh, right whales, a certain headlines probably crossed a, a, a lot of people's minds. Um, and this is the doozy of the question of the night, and I'm gonna give it to you. Okay, you got yeah, a, go for you it. You got a go heads up, so, um, so just thinking about, um, why is climate change discourse so polarized? There's so many reasons. That's a whole nother panel, right? Um, it really kind of comes down to the narrow view through which various stakeholders kind of view the problem. Um, I found your article that you wrote uh, that's available online where you kind of talk about the role of subjectivity or bias um, within big data and how that influences even with the science field. Um, not just humanities. Can you maybe just speak to kind of what you wrote in that article? Yes, I write a lot of articles, so I'm not sure which one you refer to, but um, there is a lot of, so there's, so there, the other, I guess the other side of big data in this turning on the light metaphor is that it's going to turn on a light in areas where that data comes from. And areas where there's not data remain dark. And this is, um, led to a, this emerging field called data justice. It's much more developed in um, other fields besides environmental science, but it's starting to be understood in the environmental science too. Where you choose to collect your data is going to impact how decisions are made and who gets influenced by those decisions. Um, so when it comes to say something like the controversy around whales and lobstering in Maine, I'm not gonna say anything too controversial here. I sit on the, um, uh, it's called the Take Reduction Team, which is NOAA's um, advising team that helps advise them on certain regulations to come up with. And we're made up of, there are people in the fishing industry in that team, there are people from conservation, managers. So it's, very, it's people from all perspectives um, sharing their, their points of view. Um, so I'm in the middle of all of this and I'm sympathetic to um, all, the, all the points of view. One of the problems though, when it comes to the way um, NOAA, ha NOAA is addressing this problem in Maine is Maine is one of the areas most sensitive to the regulations because we have so much fishing gear. But because whales are not frequently here, we're also one of the areas where there is very little data. So you wind up having to make decisions um, that in Maine are based on really high uncertainty. There's lots and lots of data from places like um, Cape Cod and Massachusetts where there, for one, there are a lot of whales. For two, there's also a lot more um, just survey effort in general. You know, Massachusetts is a more populous state. They have a lot more resources than we have and, and so on. And so that's where, you know, this, um, this concept of data justice comes into play because 
you know, wherever you stand on the, the debate or the controversy around whales and lobstering, we're sort of working in the dark here in Maine in the decisions that are made. And, um, and that's one of the reasons that, that I guess that I'm sympathetic to people on both sides of the, of the issue is because they both get frustrated because, you know, whichever way you view the issue, the other side can say, well, you know, we don't have data on that or, you know, um, that sort of thing. But this idea, uh, this idea of data justice pervades our society. As more and more algorithms are, are making decisions for us and are using the data that's collected in biased and unbalanced ways, that decision-making power winds up uh, coming away from people and going into these algorithms. And the biases that are in the data wind up being reflected in the decisions that are made. Yeah, it's fascinating to think about. Um, to kind of pivot us back to kind of artists, the rest of the panel, what, who do you or any examples of artists kind of responding or even disrupting this tendency in our culture to kind of just live in our own echo chambers? How are they crossing, crossing the aisles in the work that they do? How about you? <laughs> <laughs> well, there, I don't, I don't think you have a slide about it for it because I didn't think about it at the time, but in the North Atlantic Triennial, there were these uh, sculptures. Um, they looked like big pink cinder blocks, uh, but they were actually developed by this Denmark Danish artist collective who goes by the name Superflex uh, that were developed with scientists based off um, the, I'm going to get this totally wrong because I'm not a scientist or marine biologist, but the way I understand it, the color that attracts certain sea polyps to uh, grow and live in uh, coral. And they, uh, off the coast of Denmark, have got the permission of the Danish government to submerge these sculptures as public sculptures for sea life knowing that the coral reefs are no longer going to be there in a certain amount of time. So they are making sculptures for sea creatures because the sea levels will rise, the water will inhabit their art sculptures. Um, and so this is unprecedented in Denmark. Um, and they are some of the leading artists there who are working with researchers and scientists and thinking about uh, you know, cross-disciplinary approaches to saving our planet and kind of breaking the mold of what art can be, particularly in the public space. So we had these three lifelike, they were, I'm 5'3", so they were as tall as I was, um, in the room and you would approach them and they were like Pepto-Bismol pink and you were like, <laughs> what are these things? Um, but that's where they were coming from. So they were coming from science with a very intentional strategic mission. Of course, um, under the auspices of this exhibition, placed within a gallery. So they were displaced from their purpose, but through interpretive materials and conversations with the artists, we were able to share with the public that this was a much bigger artistic and scientific collaboration that was happening off the coast of Denmark to revive uh, sea life for the future. And to me, I was like, Shh, okay, you shouldn't even be talking to me. Like, <laughs> why are you in this exhibition? But it was mind boggling and amazing that people are coming up with ideas um, to bring our world into a different place. So that hmm. is my answer. It's a great story. Thanks. Collaboration. Yeah. Collaboration. Um, I want to turn uh, to Deb and give you an opportunity to talk a little bit about work, your work. And I looked into the Gulf of Maine Marine Education Association's mission to create ocean literate citizens to create connections between science and community. Can you just define, I love that phrase, an ocean literate citizen. Like what is that and how do you build connections to that? So the Gulf of Maine Marine um, Education Association is a the regional group of there's a National Marine Educators Association and there's tens of smaller ones around the country. So um, trying to create an ocean literate citizenry is a is a common goal. And basically the, the it's folks who understand that 
the ocean has a direct impact on our lives and that we impact it. So there's seven principles of ocean literacy from understanding that our ocean is, is one ocean in many forms and that ocean has a huge influence on weather and climate. And I wrote them all down because I don't remember them all off the top of my head, um, but include, you know, that the ocean is largely unexplored. And so understanding that humans and the ocean are inextricably linked, understanding that we can turn to changes that are happening in the ocean to as, you know, canary in the coal mine to see what's happening um, and to be able to do something about it to take action as well. So we're a, a small group. We're really good at networking. Um, I, uh, Nick used to sit on the board as well, and I met Anna through that as well. <laughs> uh, so we're uh, informal and formal educators as well as scientists and usually try to pair, pair up an event with the science and the education piece. Yeah, just looking at their website, and you can access it through that QR code there, just the wealth of resources um, that really just hits to the theme of this, this panel is how do you communicate these scientific uh, issues uh, to a broader public. Um, I want to return to something you just said in terms of situating humans as not only influencing the ocean but influenced by it. And I want to kind of bring it back to Anna to the exhibit about how you integrated that concept um, and I think it plays out very visually in the eco lab but kind of how important that was to you because I remember we had a lot of conversations about uh, making, say, say making sure that humans are not um, at the top of the pyramid but we're a member of the ocean community as well. So, so sorry, what, what's the question? I, I, I forgot, the, I didn't Hear the beginning part. Yeah, just how humans um, are not the center of the universe, I guess. Yeah. It's a nice, not nice way to put it, but um, that <laughs> we are part of an ecosystem, um, not the most important aspect of it, and how that comes through your exhibit. How that comes through in the exhibit, um, I, I, I just hope it comes through. It's, it's, <laughs> a, it's an experiment, that exhibit. I mean, it, it, I, we hope it comes through just from the energy of, of all these different artists that made all these other parts of the ecosystem. Or, or sculpture and, and painting that represents the, the, the actual parts of the ecosystem. So that's what you hope is that we, we, we tried to make it immersive so that you felt as if you were actually in it. And the, the, when, when the exhibit was up at Bigelow, actually, um, it was very different. We had, we had the, it was the, the space up there, it's a, it's a wonderful um, state-of-the-art building, and the space we had is in the entryway of this science lab, most of the labs are upstairs and downstairs and other places, and this is when you come in. And it was about 30 feet this way, um, where we had the 24-foot whale hanging, and then it was, it was probably um, 30 feet this way, but it was about seven feet off the, off the floor. So just imagine something that was a long piece, but we had a balcony between these big bank of windows and the balcony, so we had to have everything be 10 feet this way. So it just, it, it Everybody made in their studios this stuff so it fit in this space, this kind of like. And what, one of the, my favorite things that Nick would say when he would come to work is, is that you always said this. He said that it made you feel as if you were part of the ocean, part of the ecosystem, because it was, it was so large. But it was also how we did it. And I think everybody had this in mind when they were working. And then it just kind of came out with the artwork. And I think it's the same with this. You have ideas, you try to put them across while you're working, but you don't do it in a didactic way. You do it in more of an intuitive way. And then you just hope for the best. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sense of discovery, right? That's yeah. what it builds. Um... Yeah, and I think, I, I mean, I, I think it succeeds. And it just, it would be a question for everybody here, you know, um, when you go to try to think about that. Is this, is this making you more aware of your place? Right. Um, Deb, I have one last question for you, and you hinted at it earlier, but earlier in the panel. Um, but student anxieties, right? How, what are you seeing in the classrooms? Um, our next panel is about youth advocacy in in the environment. So, like, how, what do you see? What can you kind of speak to that in a little bit more detail? And and is there hope among among that group in your in your classrooms? I'll give you their emails. Let me know what they say. <laughs> Um, hopefully, hopefully, you know, I think 
that the it depends on the class that I'm teaching as well. The coastal ecosystems class takes a look at you know what it takes to live on the coast and in on the rocky shore in a marsh on the beach and there's a lo there's a lot of relief I think for them in in just sort of studying the ecosystem of course then I said well we're going to look at this marsh which is preserved because sea level is going to rise so you know what do you want everybody to know now that we've learned about sea level rise and what it takes to live in a marsh um so I think they are hungry for things that they can do to be part of the solution. Mm -hmm. And that I think touches on something I didn't even think about until our discussion tonight, but kind of art as therapy, as, as a catharsis for some of those anxieties and um, providing something to be a part of, um, a way to discover a solution. Um, so we're hurtling towards the conclusion here and I have one final question for every panelist. And Anna, again, I'm gonna start with you. Um, I just want to kind of center on this idea of hope um, what have you learned through collaborating with your EcoArts team or other uh, people here at the museum while working on this exhibit that, that makes you hopeful? Well, again, it, it's sort of repeating what I said earlier, but it's the, to, to me the whole, the whole um, advocacy, stewardship, activism answer is to be involved, either making art, volunteering for, for an organization that is, is dealing with these issues, um, if you're younger, make a career that will help in some way. But to feel as if you're part of something outside of your personal life. Um, and I think it's, uh, it's, it's a rewarding thing. And that's what you find if you're working with other people, that as soon as they start working with things that are outside of their, themselves, that are important in this way, because it's the most important thing to me, the planet and, the, and this thing we call the natural world. If they can do that, then then it's 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 that's that's going to help. I mean, that's the hope. Right. I mean, who knows where we're going with it? We don't know, but I think it's just the involvement itself. And that leads to to Deb back to you and just kind of how do exhibits like Sea Change or kind of artworks featured in Down North make your job easier in advocating for behavior change? Well, I think that many times students come to my classes and tell me about amazing exhibits and experiences that they had. Um, so they're coming in with some of this groundwork laid for how to engage with the science in a storytelling way, and they're ready to go. And they learn all the art, and I give them the topic, and then they come out with these amazing projects that I get to see. So um, I think as part of that's all. I was going to repeat myself. <laughs> but yeah, building those bridges, interdisciplinary bridges, I think is. Yeah, the interdisciplinary bridges, but also the inspiration and seeing what can be done. Right. So they're motivated to carry on taking science classes, even though they've chosen to go to art school. <laughs> it is possible. It is. <laughs> um, Jamie, um, I'm going to bring up one more work from the Down North here as your concluding question. So here we see Lauren uh, Finsterstock's The Order of Things, and again, quoting from the catalog, uh, mm -hmm. pokes holes in Western fant fantasies of mastery over nature, but also a potential for an integrated way forward. So in your work, kind of synthesizing the changing North Atlantic and the stories of these artists, um, what do you see in the current conversation among these artists that makes you hopeful? Well, I think um, what makes me hopeful and why I became an art historian is why is because I believe artists are translators of the world in which we live, and it is a cross-disciplinary approach, and that is exactly what Lauren is doing here. It's a contemporary cabinet of curiosities that is beautiful and poetic and chaotic and disturbing and nature cannot be contained, uh, but it has an element of human touch and it is also gentle and inviting and curious. And so I think there is an element of hope. Um, and I think artists like scientists and researchers um, are by nature curious beings and I don't think that will ever fade so that is very optimistic.
Yeah, absolutely. All right, Nick. Is there a hopeful forecast in the future? Uh, yes. Let me make a prediction here. Um, <laughs> yeah, hope hope is really hard as a scientist, if any, as an environmental or ocean scientist. If any any of you read the news on the like the IPCC reports, that's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. They come out every few years, and they make predictions about the future of the climate. And they don't mince words. They're, these are kind of the cold hard facts, and they can be really tough to, um, especially when you get into the like if you really if you really sit down and ingest that stuff, or if your job is dealing with these questions on a day to day basis. It can be it can be often hard to find um, sources of hope. There's a lot of anxiety among climate scientists and other in, environmental scientists, just like you're seeing with your with your students, and people have different ways of of coping with that. There's um, a social scientist named, so climate anxiety now is its own field. And there's a scientist, a social scientist named Britt Ray, who's written this book called Climate Dread. And she's done all this research, you know, it, demonstrating that uh, young people today are choosing not to have children and making other life decisions because of, because of how they see the future. Um, and, um, you know, and, and how hard it is often to find, to find hope. Um, I think about um, Octavia Butler, who wrote the Parable of the Sower and the Parable of the Talents, um, you know, 30 or 40 years ago. And these are these are dystopias, you know, sci-fi predictions about the future, where she wrote about environmental collapse in um, surprisingly accurate ways. You know, 40 years ago, had this amazing foresight for the way different things would, would unfold. Dystopias, by the way, are also really popular amongst uh, kids. <coughs> um, I have two young kids who read lots of them, and all of their friends do too, so I think that's tied up in it. Um, but uh, one of the things, I read an interview with Octavia Butler once, who was writing these really bleak futures, and, um, and the interviewer asked, I'm, I'm going to approximate this, I don't remember exactly, but the interviewer asked something like, you know, you must be like really hopeless about the future and like not see any hope for the future and so on because you see things this way. And her response was something to the effect of, you know, just writing these things is my act of hope. You know, the IPCC report doesn't, the interpanel, intergovernmental panel on, I'm garbling that acronym, but they don't come out with these predictions about these dire climate predictions um, to depress everyone, that itself is the act of hope. They put out these predictions because they believe that we can define our future. All of these dire predictions about the future, yes, they're facts. We're seeing them in the data, and they can be very distressing, especially if you look at them every day. Uh, but you wouldn't be making those reports if you didn't believe in, in human agency and our ability to, to paint that blank canvas of our future ourselves. Um, and so I think... The more people we have involved across disciplines, building communities where we're all doing this together, and you know, uh, our projects like this, that sort of thing. That's that's sort of how I see hope fitting into the equation, as it were. All right, that I I have nothing to add to that one. That was beautiful. <laughs> um, so with that, we are actually going to spend maybe about 15 minutes on a Q and A. If you have questions, we welcome you um, to raise your hands. 